Olá, sejam muito bem-vindos ao webinário de lançamento. Welcome do... to our webinar uh, to launch our report on environmental accounting and audit. I'm Mateus Couto, I'm the representative of UNAP uh, WCMC, and it's a pleasure to be here to launch this, re this report where the economic uh, and environmental accounts and all the reports on biodiversity, sustainability. It is, uh, I, I hope you are all healthy and safe. Today's event, we will have three parts, uh, an opening table, with uh, three uh, talks and then two presentations about the, the topics related to our webinar and a Q&A session. This event is being recorded and will be available uh, in YouTube for consultation later on. It is being translated into English and Spanish in addition to Portuguese language today most of our presentations will be in Portuguese and one of them in English. I hope you can use a simultaneous translation that we are offering uh, through Zoom. There is a toolbar in the, in the inferior part of the screen and an icon where you can choose the language of your uh, or your preferred language. This uh, event is promoted by UNAP in collaboration with the, uh, the WCMC, the World Conservation Center. We are uh, collaborating with uh, the, the Court of Audit of the Union of Brazil and also collaboration of uh, GIZ from Germany. This event is in collaboration with GZ and support of the Ministry for Collaboration and Economic Development of uh, the, the Republic of Germany. So we have more than 100 uh, participants. So it is a great pleasure and joy to start this opening table. Today, during the presentations, it is possible for the participants to pose questions and comments. There are two options to do so. If you want to make any question direct, directed to a certain speaker, you can uh, click the Q and A uh, the Q and A icon and pose your question or interact with uh, all the participants through the chat. So, to compose our opening panel, I would like to receive Juan Bello, the senior officer of Biodiversity and Ecosystems, uh, Ecosystems Program for Latin America and the Caribbean. He will make his presentation in English. So uh, for those who would like uh, to hear in another language, can use the translation services. Thank you so much, Mateus. And I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the UN Environment Program. Um, first of all, uh, I, I want to, to greet uh, the experts who will be with us uh, this afternoon uh, in this webinar. First of all, Mr. Jens Brueggemann, GISZ Director of Biodiversity, Forest and Climate, Mr. Hugo Judison, uh, Secretary of External Control on Agriculture and Environment, a very good friend of us, Professor Braulo Diaz from University of Brasilia and former Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity and our colleague from the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center, uh, Raquel Agra. Last, uh, last December, uh, the United Nations uh, Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Say that a conference uh, at Columbia University that making peace with nature is the defining task for the 21st century. 
And the point is that we are facing a global crisis. The rate of ecosystem loss, environmental degradation, and species extinctions are unprecedented. Uh, nevertheless, our societies and our economies are totally dependent upon nature. It, it supplied us with clean air, clean water, every mouthful of food that we eat. We depend on nature fully. So the anticipated post-2020 global biodiversity framework calls on governments to make the ecological foundation of our economies central to development and fiscal planning. We are entering into a new era in which we will need to address all these challenges if we want to achieve the sustainable development goals and the vision of living in harmony with nature. So the UN Secretary General High Level Panel on Global Sustainability that was back in 2012 concluded that the current economic model is pushing us inexorably towards the limits of natural resources and planetary life support systems. So in order to reverse this trajectory, policymakers, land managers, business, and other actors need a regularly updated and consistent supply of information on the environment and the benefits it provides so it may be in mainstream into decision making. National environmental accounting has been developed, developed to directly respond to these information needs. So the system of national accounts is a framework for organizing information on economic activities and informing national economic policy. However, it has long been recognized that it fails to account for the degradation of nature resor natural resources and associated welfare consequences. This has been fundamentally misleading to policymakers as it implies that nature and the benefits it provides are free and can be ignored or degraded in the pursuit of economic growth. This assumption results in permanent losses in wealth as ecosystems disappear or deteriorate, compromising the long-term ability of nature to contribute to human well-being and the economy. The system of environmental economic accounting aims to address this deficiency by accounting for the environment and linking the environment and environmental information through common concepts, definitions, and classifications. As a result of the collaboration between UNEP, the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center, the Tribunal, the Tribunal Federal de Cuentas, TCU, the Brazil, and GIZ, we are launching the report on environmental accounting environmental economic accounts and their role on auditing biodiversity and other environmental and sustainability issues. This report provides an overview on the adoption of environmental accounts in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean and how this can be used for environmental accounting. So we uh, in UNEP, we acknowledge the very significant contributions of the superior audit institutions to the Convention on Biological Diversity and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The superior audit institutions can play a major role in protecting nature, precisely by auditing the implementation of public policies that have negative or positive impacts on the environment. The coordinated audits on protected areas that was conducted by the OLACEFs and supported by GSZ are exceptional case on how effective are the audit institutions and how, and how they can provide valuable inputs for improving national policies and contributing to multilateral environmental agreements. So we in UNEP, we, we truly appreciate the contributions from the auditors in the Secretary of External Control on Agriculture and the Environment and the support provided by GIS. And we hope that this report that is being presented today can be an initial step for a lasting collaboration between our organizations. I hope that everyone will enjoy this webinar. And I again, thank you all for being with us this afternoon. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Juan, for this uh, important opening remarks. Uh, in fact, it's a, a very good timing for, for launching this report, as you, you've mentioned. Thank you. So I will return to Portuguese. Vou voltar ao, ao português agora. So back to Portuguese. I will ask uh, the panel to show the slide in Spanish. Um, we noticed on how explaining how to choose uh, the language. We noticed that some people were not able to select the language. Is it possible, Augusto, to help us with that? Bien, voy, voy a hablar un, un poco en español aquí. I'm going to um, speak Spanish a little bit so you can maybe listen to the English translation and see if it's working. And you may choose English or Spanish. Bien, ahora dando sequencia en portugués. So now continuing in Portuguese. Uh, our next talks will be in Portuguese. Thank you. Thank you, Augusto. So our, for those speaking Portuguese, you can click interpretation and just leave it off because all the talks will be in Portuguese. And I hope that you are uh, succeeding in receiving the translation into, into Spanish and English. Yes, thank you, Augusto. So continuing with our opening panel, it is a great joy to invite our Secretary for External Control of Agriculture and Environment of the Court of, uh, of Audit of the Union of Brazil, Mr. Hugo Judson. Good afternoon, Mateus. Good, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, on behalf of the, the the court of audit of the union i believe that the key word mateos is uh, collaboration i'm ugo schutzen and i have two hats here which is the tcu and comtema the special technical commission for the environment and in the preparation of this technical study that is extremely relevant the court of audit of the union is is uh, um, an institution that help our congress evaluating the efficiency of public policies as juan said we are uh, a supreme audit institution and we are part of the OLAF, OLACEFs, the Organization of Latin American and Caribbean Supreme Audit Institutions, which has a, a special committee for environment where we are uh, present, called CONTEMA. So today I talk on behalf of CONTEMA and on behalf of TCU. And first of all, we would like to uh, uh, thank this uh, report of this study carried out by UNAP WCMC uh, that counted with the collaboration of Germany through GIC. I also thank the participants, Mateus, Juan, Jens Grubman, Raquel Agua and Braulio Diaz. So, without much further ado. Today's topic is important to highlight that the environmental accounts are extremely important for sustainable development because they try to compatibilize the environmental assets and ecosystem services and include them in public policies. The topic of public policies 
has a highlight in different international agreements. For instance, the Convention about Biological Diversity and the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, as mentioned previously. In Brazil, we can mention uh, an act published in 2017 that established the internal green uh, product or the gross um, green product that is uh, calculated by IBG at the Brazilian Statistic uh, Institution. Environmental accounts are still not that much evaluated by controllers, but I would like to bring a recent experience that uh, approaches that, which is an auditing in protected areas, uh, a work carried out by TCU in uh, in the sphere on Comtema, with 17 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, in addition to Portugal and Spain. The executive summary will be launched soon, and I know that many that of those watching us took part in this work, and I, I thank you all. So in the context of today's event, the study launched by PNUMA contributes for the control uh, institutions so they can in future works address this issue and its relevance for public policies as such as said by juan and mateus this will be in three languages to be available for uh, accountants and controllers in a different parts of the world as president of contema it's important to highlight that we recognize the strategic relevance of uh, alliances as this one with uh, UNAP and also the results achieved with the uh, German cooperation implemented by GIZ. So going to the end of my brief uh, talk, I would like to give some highlights. First, environment is recognized as environmental heritage and should be well managed, not only by state, but also the society. Point two, we are viewing a, a paradigm shift as the as, as AIs understand the environment as an asset and a resource with a value that be, can be quantified and appreciated. And this context will uh, provide a more integrated policies and more integrated execution of these policies in special uh, in cross-sectional topics as environment and to finish my talk i would like to thank the effort of all of those who believed that the word cooperation brings important results actually we used to say together we are stronger but I would like to say together we are better. Each institution with their expertise, with their role, with the support of the civil society, the broader the conduct of uh, entrepreneurs, the better the work, be it public policies or not. So thank you very much, Mateus, and thank you very much for those who are here participating of our event. It's a great joy to receive this, uh, this study that is being launched. Thank you very much, Hugo. Thank you very much for your kind words of opening on behalf of the UNAP. I would like to say that we are quite happy with our cooperation work, and we hope this is just the beginning of a long lasting cooperation effort. So continuing with the opening session now, I would like to invite the uh, director of the bio Diversity Forest and Climate Program, Dr. Jens Brugman from GIZ. So you have the floor, Mr. Brugman. Thank you so much, Mateus. It's quite an honor to attend this event and to participate in the opening ceremony of this webinar. I would like to welcome all of you, ladies and gentlemen, all of the attendees who are here with us in this session. And I would like to greet Dr. Denise Hamou, that is the coordinator of the United Nations program for the environment here in Brazil. My dear colleagues, 
uh, Mateos, Dr. Juan Bello, that is the coordinator of biodiversity of the UN program on the environment as well. Dr. Hugo Chudson, uh, a partner and a secretary under the Court of Audits in Brazil, and Dr. Uh, Raquel Agra, who is in charge of the Cambridge uh, Monitoring Center under the UNAP, and Professor Braulio Diaz. We have a long history of cooperation with Dr. Diaz as well. So, continuing with Juan's words and also Hugo's words, I do believe that Hugo has given us a new motto, a new motto for the GIZ work. So together we are stronger, as he says, together we are better. GIZ is the Technical Cooperation Committee of the German government that is highly engaged in strengthening this cooperation to achieve results. Our key points of uh, contact are the Ministry of Economic and Social Development that is funding the project to strengthen the uh, controls in the environmental areas, such as uh, the SAEs and the uh, Court of Audits. But we also have other environmental projects here in Brazil. I coordinate uh, one cluster of these areas for the uh, protection of the environment. And I work with the sectoral ministries. We also have uh, the uh, committees of the uh, Ministry of the Environment in Germany. We use what we call the AKI. AKI is an initiative for climate protection. In addition to uh, projects to fight against the uh, climate change, we also have this area to deal with the environmental projects. So it's quite interesting addressing the environmental accounts. And that's the theme at hand here today with the launch of the report publication. This is something that has been in force since, um, since when Brazil was the uh, host of the uh, conference that resulted in three major UN agreements, one of them, the uh, biodiversity. And in 1992, in the ECHO Summit, since then, Brazil has been a, a major stakeholder in Latin America and in the world in the area of uh, upholding these international themes addressing the environment. So it is very much important that the, uh, the ideas on the accounting, on the environmental accounting systems that will enable us to quantify and ascribe monetary values to the flows of the ecosystem and to the environment. So these are highly important systems. As uh, Hugo said, it's very much important for, her, for us to have a broader perspective. The common asset, the asset that we all enjoy, that we all have, very often suffers, suffers from the interventions. Sometimes they're not perceived such as civil works, but sometimes uh, this will result in a cost for those who take advantage in these areas, of these areas. And there is also a reduction of the value for the uh, country heritage, for the peoples and for the world. So there are many challenges to tackle. So we should be really assessing and developing public policies to incorporate this cost as well as the assets and the costs that we incur into to preserve the environment because we don't want to see losses in the national and international heritage, right? In order to address the uh, public policies, 
Well, very often these uh, public policies, they are organized in sectors and not always can the countries coordinate these uh, policies under the 2030 agenda, for example, they do have a sectoral approach. So the role of the auditing, uh, the superior auditing entities play a key role because they may analyze the many public policies and identify where these uh, public policies converge and how we may attain desirable or non-desirable results. So I believe that the German cooperation, which has been enhancing the implementation of the environmental economic quotas system over time with global projects such as values, and also in Brazil, we have the local projects discussing the uh, contribution of the local contribution of forest, water, and power for the uh, sectoral public policies and for the strategic planning of the Brazilian administration. So this cooperation is very much important. Just like the uh, cooperation efforts we've had in the last five years, a regional partnership with the uh, Court of Audits of the Union and OLASAF to enhance the quality of the environmental audits and to promote them as well. So I'm quite happy to see the uh, publication, the publication that we launched today, because we have further opportunities to learn more we are going to learn more from uh, Rachel's and Braulio's presentations. And I hope this partnership is well addressed. I hope this can bring an impact to all of you in the work that you develop. I wish you all success and thank you very much. I would like to thank you for the opportunity on behalf of the uh, director of the program, Dr. Hamidis and Chris Orvosen, who prepared this seminar together with the UNAP and the TCU colleagues. So they have been working in all of these projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jens. It's a great satisfaction to be able to acknowledge the fundamental support from GIZ the German Cooperation Agency. We are very much grateful um, for your support that enabled this study, the issuing of the report. We do hope that this is just the beginning of a long lasting cooperation effort addressing this sector, addressing this area. Now, the next speaker in our panel We'll begin with the presentations on the report by Dr. Raquel Agra and then Professor Brolio Diaz. We are going to listen about the implementation of accounts and other topics related to biodiversity. I would like to remind you all that right now you may ask your questions. You may use the Zoom uh, tool. So in the bottom bar of your chat box, you have two ways to interact. And we are going to be answering some of the questions during the discussion panel after the presentations. And depending on the number of questions, well, the other questions that are not answered, we are going to reply to you in written, okay, in the chat box. I would like to remind you that the presentation is now being recorded. It's going to be made available in the UNAP YouTube channel, the TCU YouTube uh, channel, OLASEFs and GIZ YouTube channels as well. So you may um, invite other people to watch the talk that is going to be delivered, the talks that are going to be delivered. So I would like to invite Dr. Raquel Agra, the official of the uh, World Convention Monitoring Center, WCMC. So she's the official of the uh, program 
and since uh, she has been in that position since June 2020, supporting the agendas of biodiversity and climate. She has a PhD in biology from the Aveiro University, a master in ecology from the Coimbra University. She has experience in the environment, focusing on biodiversity, ecosystem services, climate change, and public policies for sustainable development, including the uh, promotion of the integration of biodiversity in development planning. Between 2012 and 2020, she worked in Brazil uh, in the environmental sector, in the public service sector, and also with the uh, German Cooperation for Sustainable Development, that is GIZ, in the implementation of a project, the regional local TB in coordination with the Ministry of the Environment and other partners. This project was in charge of coordinating the various components to integrate biodiversity in the public and private decision-making processes, including the support to IBGE, ANA, the agencies, and other agencies in developing the environmental accounting system according to the international statistical uh, parameters and standards. So Rachel, you have 35 minutes for your presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Mateus, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My special uh, greetings to the opening panel, Dr. Juan Bello, Dr. Jens, and uh, Hugo Chedison. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to address the environmental economic accounts and how this has been evolving in Brazil and also in Latin America and the Caribbean. It was a pleasure working with this topic in partnership with the Ministry of the Environment and also with the Brazilian Institute of Statistics and Geography and the National Agency of Waters and other partners in the local regional project that we devised. So a few years later, one year later, after leaving the technical cooperation, I've been working in the World Conservation Monitoring Center under the UNEP. It's a pleasure to be able to continue to work in this topic and to share the important uh, unfoldings that we've had. So I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. It's perfect. Initially, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Mrs. Agra is cutting. Well, we have here the uh, cooperation team and it happened in a very short period of time, so it was a challenge for us. I would like to highlight that this was a work that was done by me and by Mr. Stephen King, Mateus Couto, Mr. Fossi and Mr. Casola as well from the WCMC, the Monitoring Center and Preservation of Biodiversity Center. I would like to uh, thank Chris, Marcio Salva from the UNAP and Adriano Judas from the Court of Audits of the Union and on behalf of them, I would like to thank the TCU team for their availability and for their support in developing this work. So I'm going to introduce the report. I'm going to talk about the environmental program and the environmental economic accounts. I'm going to discuss the concepts and the methodologies associated to the environmental aspect, the progress in Latin America and the Caribbean region, for the uh, generation of the uh, environmental economic accounts. And they have to be included in the public policies. And I'm going to talk about the potential of use in environmental audits as well. The societies, they depend on the environment and on the natural resources. So nature, by means of its ecosystems, provides a whole set of assets and goods. They call, they're called ecosystem services. We have the regulation of climate, the regulation of climate events, the diseases. Nature provides food and raw materials and water and all of the nature contributions, they um, really help to support the economy, the economic entities, and the human well-being as well. 
Some information was taken from the report of the World Economic uh, Forum using the intergovernment platform on ecosystem services, showing the strong interdependence between economy and the human uh, well being, which are related to biodiversity and ecosystem services. 75% of the key agricultural crops account for one third of the global production of foodstuffs, uh, and they depend on the uh, pollinizing animals. And we also use this as a fuel to meet the uh, needs of primary energy. So there has been uh, an exponential increase in the use of natural resources and the uh, degradation of ecosystems be it because of exploration or any kind of impact is today one of the key challenges of humankind and of the societies. The recent report of the uh, biodiversity economics that was launched early this year in 2021 really reinforces this idea that had been discussed in the past by other reports, for example, the uh, report made by the MIT on the limits of growth, also the Rome report. So we had this idea on the economic growth uh, that really affects, uh, affects the natural regenerative processes. So it affects the basis of the human society to which economics uh, belongs. So we have the risk of uh, the extinction of 1 million species, 178 million of hectares of forest that were lost in the last 30 years, an area that is the same size of Libya, and more than 85% of uh, humid zones um, and swamps that were lost. This has consequence for the economy and for people. The well being of 3.2 billion people has been affected by environmental degradation. There is uh, a loss of ecosystem services accounting for 10% of the global annual GDP and more than one trillion of dollars in losses per year that was estimated, which is associated to pandemics and emerging zoonoses. Just to give you a very contemporary example because of the impacts that will incur into because of the pandemic, social and environmental impacts brought by the COVID-19. So we acknowledge this situation, and this was mentioned by Mr. Bello. It results from the uh, political efforts, from the financial sector, from the civil society, and from the international cooperation efforts as well. So we do acknowledge uh, this interdependence. So we need to address the environmental degradation. The pyramids that you see here has the grouping of the uh, SDGs. And this is addressed by a report that Mr. Bello mentioned by the UNAP, published early this year, addressing uh, making peace with nature. And the pyramid shows how the environment is important for the social and economic development. And the SDGs, they are truly associated to nature, number 14 and 15. So all of the SDGs uh, are associated to production, consumption, and well-being. In the same report, we see that the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem service increased pollution and are responsible for committing 80% of achieving the SDGs. So to revert this trajectory, one of the pathways is giving to policy makers, companies and other stakeholders access to consistent information about environment and the benefits of nature to economy and human well-being. So these efforts can be included in decision making because what is not favorable has great chances of being not valued. And the current environmental crisis is associated to be considered as a mere externality to economic development. So it should include the value of contributions of nature for human well-being and economy. So environmental accounting is being development, developed to respond directly to these needs. So now going to the concepts associated to environmental accounting, 
we have the system for environmental accounts, which is in a structure to centralize the information generation and distribution on the countries that is evolved, evolving since the 1950s. And based when the national uh, accounting systems, we can produce several economic indicators uh, based uh, as, for instance, the GDP. Uh, evaluating the performance of economy and also formulate uh, economic policies and as this is standardized and follow the national international and united united nation recommendations allow to compare the performance of different countries so for long it's recognized that it is in the failure here is considering the degradation and con condition of ecosystems which is not considered neither the implications of this degradation in terms of economy and well-being. This leads to the formulation of new public policies that uh, lead to a wrong understanding that these benefits are external externalities and can be uh, degraded and recovered in the economic growth process, leading to a, a permanent loss of wealth uh, with a loss of natural resources. And therefore, in this context, emerges environmental accounting to complement the national accounting systems and controlling systems uh, associated to the natural capital that aims to uh, control account for the environmental resources considering goods and services services provided by nature and used and the wealth generated by these to the economy so environmental accounting connects economy to environment and under to trying to understand the interactions uh, complement uh, uh, allow for the formulation of more sustainable policies allow uh, more sustainable policies and complement the GDP. And to produce this system of economic accounts, CES, uh, SCEA, where the natural resources are accounted in terms of feed stocks and flows, and as in uh, currency terms, and the relation between the generation of wealth and use of the resources. In 2020, according to the statistic information of the United States, uh, Nations, more than 90 countries are already producing their economic and environmental accounting. And as this system apply concepts, structures and principles the, of the national accounting systems, we will have to consider them. So. The SCEA, the system of uh, environmental economic accounts, is uh, composed by a central framework adopted by the UN as the first international standard for environmental uh, for environmental economic accounting systems that consider natural resources as water, energy, fishery, and wood are used in the economy together with the wealth resulting from the economic activities and uh, the residues and waste generated by the economic uh, activity. So the systems go beyond the use of the re natural resources. And to complement the central framework, we have the experimental environmental accounts and the ecosystem accounts which was a landmark in 2014 and surprisingly less than one month ago in march 5th 2021 the statistic commission of united nations approved the ecosystem accounts as also an international statistic standard and now and from now this is also recognized as a central framework uh, providing more legal uh, safe uh, security for the countries to approve their accounting systems based on the ecosystem assets and uh, the flows of ecosystem services that provide economic activity. Here, just to show a timeline of these guidelines and landmarks produced uh, 
vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations that are being developed since 2012 in the uh, economic environmental accounting system. So now bringing a little bit of the structure of the central framework. So this, uh, the central framework is a accounting conceptual system that consider a series of tables and spreadsheets to consider these interactions between economy and environment to uh, create comparable indicators. So this system includes in the part of environment stocks and uh, like fishing stocks, the flow of the ecosystem services that enter the economy, the uh, inputs that the environment receive from the economy, for instance, the, the re residues and emissions for water and air, and also in level of economy, the instruments and the wealth. Here, an example for Brazil. Brazil published for the first time their economic environmental accounts in 2018, which is a, a landmark, with the results of the accounts for the period 2013-17. And two years later, in 2020, Brazil presents the second uh, exercise of water uh, uh, economy produced by the Brazilian Institute of Geogra Geography and Statistics from this period between 13 and 17 uh, with uh, regionalized information. And here we have uh, a scheme with the information of the water flows in blue are the water flows from environment to economy, for instance, water catchment for uh, productive systems and families. In yellow and blue, we see the uh, flows from uh, in the economy, the distribution of water from one sector to the other and to the families. And in the bottom part, in yellow, the uh, physical flows of water from economy to environment as for instance, the sewage or uh, effluents and uh, um, sewage uh, treatment. So in, Bra in Brazil, uh, there is uh, uh, an uptake of uh, more than 3,500 uh, cubic meters and the uh, actor, uh, and the main responsible in the economy for this water consumption is agriculture and livestock and aquaculture. Continuing with the results of the environmental economic accounts for water with the results of the hybrid accountings that consider the physic and environmental with the indicator of intensity in what, uh, water use and consumption. And we see that agriculture, uh, forestry and fishery is in fact what use the greatest amount of water to produce the same amount of wealth to Brazil as compared to other sectors, other industries. Other information that is also uh, brought by IBGE, GE, the individualizing for each chat box is the same indicator water uh, user consume consumption throughout this timeline for 2013 17 we can see in the same sector agriculture that there was an improvement in water consumption producing with the same amount more wealth be uh, between these years so this is, is an example of uh, count produced in this uh, central framework. Now, the experimental and uh, environmental ecosystem accounts gathering information more specialized about ecosystem, ecosystem assets. So the first step is determine the extension and condition, and this is identified in environmental accounts as extension accounts and condition accounts that have these uh, dimensions. 
as such, we treat uh, natural areas as assets and the, the range of ecosystem services as a flow that goes to the dimension of economy and society contributing to production and consumption activities. And we can also see that from economy to environment, there from consumption, there is environmental impact, uh, impact and pressures. And, but there's also actions for environmental recovery and environmental management that improve both extension and condition of ecosystems. And one of the criticisms for ecosystem accounts is that it has a spatial uh, approach and the benefits in the ecosystems depend where it occurs. The location of the assets and, and the beneficiaries, the specific beneficiaries. The system of uh, environmental economic accounts and the ecosystem accounts have five main accounts. The extent, uh, extension of ecosystem physic, uh, physical accounts that re uh, record the ecosystem assets in a, in a specific area. It can be a country, it can be a water basin, it can be uh, a total area, a specific area. The second is uh, the account of uh, ecosystem asset condition, physic, that supply information about the, the period of ecosystem and the capacity of supplying ecosystem services. Then we have the flow accounts in the ecosystem services, both physical and monetary, that register the, the supply of services by the ecosystems and the use of the services by the economy, including governments and companies. And finally, the last are stock and flow of uh, ecosystem assets, which are monetary, that record the information of stocks and change in the stocks and reactions of ecosystem in monetary terms that include the accounting of degradation of ecosystems and improvement of ecosystems through recovery, ecologic recovery um, management. And uh, another example for Brazil, the calculation of ecosystem accounts, IBGE in partnership and support of the uh, European Union project produced the first uh, ecosystem extension accounts for the, the use of the land and biomass and biomas, uh, evaluating the extension of natural areas and biomes in the area, adopting as a uh, environmental cutoff the main biomas in Brazil. Here in the table, we see for the the uh, terrestrial biomes they are not all here but all the biomes had a negative um, result in this period evaluated from to, uh, 2000 to 2018 and the total loss of about 500 square square kilometers of natural areas there was lost and in absolute quant uh, quantitative or reduction of areas re uh, happened mostly in the Amazonian and the Cerrado Savanna biome. IBGE also pro uh, proposes an indicator of uh, intensity of change in uh, land use that has two years of uh, reference, 2017 and 18, to georeference the areas in the country where there is the main process of change in the uh, type of land use. This is calculated based in the accounts of extension and varies from one to three. One correspond to the less intensity changes of the land use and three the most intense changes. And this chart summing all the different contributions on the different changes, we see that between 
2016 and 18, we had 88 million square kilometers of change in the land in the use of land in Brazil. Considering the bars in dark orange that correspond the uh, intensity three, we can see it correspond to areas uh, of forests or, or natural fields that were transformed in anthropo an, uh, anthropic areas. So, for instance, the use of uh, livestock in almost uh, all this area in the country. Another example, not of extension accounts, but condition accounts of uh, accounts for condition of existence in, the, in this case of Guatemala. The areas here is not for the national territory, but the, for forest and uh, biological corridors. And forest coverage in productive areas, the type of the ecosystem for the years between 20, uh, 2001 and 2014. And we can see that was there was uh, forest losses mostly for uh, tropical rainforest and uh, dry uh, tropical forest that represent almost 60 percent of their total oh i'm sorry 89 percent of their total losses and guatemala made this uh, con uh, this calculation considering ecologic corridors uh, now talking about uh, the progress of uh, environmental accounting in Brazil and America, Latin America and the Caribbean that has taken a great relevance that is related to the fact that the region uh, has the, the biggest biodiversity in the planet and the most diverse countries. So these countries have uh, have are receiving a push to de develop environmental accounts for a sustainable development and they are also supporting with capacity building and strengthening and generation of knowledge to support the development of economic environmental accounts this table uh, brings the the different states and the different levels of the accounts in the region. Uh, based on the last evaluation made by the UNEP in uh, 2018, complemented with data from the World Bank. We can see that nine countries of the region already produced their accounts, the environmental economic accounts. They have it implemented officially, partially. Um, this is how we see it. And the countries that you see uh, in bold with the asterisk, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Costa Rica, Chile, Ecuador, and Guatemala, they are highlighted because they have a high level of institutionalization regarding the environmental accounts. And here uh, we have an example on how the environmental accounts are implemented in the many countries. So they use the central uh, framework for water, for energy, for wood, for uh, forestry products, for minerals and for fishing as well. But there is a limited group of countries that has developed the uh, ecosystem accounts and that's the case of Colombia. Uh, with ecosystem accounts for the national territory and also for a region that is Orinoquia. We also have the same case in Guatemala and I showed the example of the ecosystem account using the indicators for uh, forestry, for forestry areas, but they also have other ecosystem accounts and Costa Rica that has experimental accounts, ecosystem accounts. That's the case of Brazil as well. As I showed the example of the ecosystem extension accounts that were published last year, and still last year, we had the publishing of the threatened species accounts and other accounts are now being produced on ecosystems, including a pilot project for the uh, basin of Rio Grande. The case of uh, 
Peru. They have the region accounts uh, for summer term, a project that is supported by the international cooperation. Mexico, that is one of the pioneering countries in the production of the accounts. It was the first country in the region to produce the environmental accounts with many ecosystem accounts as well. And then we have Chile and Uruguay. Now, speaking about the use of uh, environmental accounts in public policies and bringing some examples of Latin America and the Caribbean regions. The environmental economic accounts has supported the many international indicators, the AISHI indicators, and this was said in the beginning. So the role of the environmental accounts is supporting the uh, 2030 agenda, as well as the uh, Biodiversity uh, Convention. So we were supported by the UN Statistical Division in 2019, and the report identified the potential of the uh, environmental accounts to support the calculation of 34 of the 147 official indicators and 21 of the 2030 indicators of the SDG targets. The environmental accounts uh, system can also support the countries to develop the key indicators. For example, in the context of their national strategies addressing uh, biodiversity and the acronym in English is NBSAP. And the accounts are also described both in the 2030 agenda and in the uh, AISHI targets in which they acknowledge the importance of the environmental economic accounts as a tool to integrate biodiversity and the ecosystems in the national planning processes. So this is widely spread and it is described in a target 15.9 of the AISHI targets, which really enable, enables us to do a screening of the biodiversity, linking it to the environmental accounts and linking it to the uh, sustainable development targets. So we have some examples uh, from the countries in the region. In the case of uh, Brazil, the result of the environmental accounts has enabled the monitoring of uh, the indicators of SDG 6, especially for the target 6.4 that is associated to the efficiency of water use in the economic activities. There is a whole discussion and advancement of the environmental accounts. This has been led by the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. And 2017, this enabled Brazil to publish the law on the green um, internal product the green national product that is an indicator that supplements the GDP. And it is in line with the national uh, heritage. It just needs to be regulated. And there is this political discussion that happened in the local project with many uh, sectoral ministries participating, addressing the potential of the use of the environmental account for water, forestry, and energy, affecting the uh, sectoral policies in Brazil and also the strategic policies in Brazil. You have three minutes. Okay. Okay, I'm going to speed up. So I have the example of Costa Rica here. The uh, power accounts, the water accounts, the forestry account that have contributed to the many public policies and sectoral policies, and also helped to develop the uh, indicators for the SDGs. And in a more strategic level, that is the policies for the national development and investment plan of that country. In the case of Mexico, the ecosystem accounts, uh, has the uh, water condition account. And these are indicators that have been used by the National Commission to monitor the water bodies. And all of the accounts have been implemented according to the uh, central framework, and they help to cal calculate the ecological GDP of that country. So this takes into account the natural resources in addition to other uh, policy instruments that have the support of the environmental accounts. The potential of the use of the environmental accounts in the environmental policies since 2010, the INTOSE, the International Organization of the uh, Supreme Auditing Institutions, they described as early as 2010, 
the role of the environmental accounting in the context of the environmental audits. But in 2010, there was this uh, milestone. The central framework was developed and the national statistics were under development and this was concluded in 2012. The report that we have now is an opportunity to provide the whole development context of the framework addressing the environmental accounts from 2010 and onwards and uh, analyzing all of the benefits that the countries had in developing their environmental accounts. So the report brings to us uh, the data, the auditing data, and the use of the environmental accounts and their potential of use addressing biodiversity, climate, and other topics. In the context of biodiversity, well, it's very much important because it provides many benefits to the development. This can be seen by the number of auditing entities that have been really uh, addressing and doing audits on biodiversity. 133 reports uh, were made. These are biodiversity audits that were made by the SAEs as of 2015. And then there's much information from the environmental accounts that support the audits on biodiversity. The uh, support to assess the performance of the environmental policies that are related to biodiversity using the environmental accounts because they provide information on the inventory and the ecosystem, their extension and conditions, and also the physical accounts that provide individual information on water, for example. The support to assess the economic uh, efficiency of the uh, policies by using the uh, ecosystem service accounts, and they show the contribution of such benefits. These are nature-based solutions, for example, and these can be assessed. For example, uh, flood measures can be assessed and this can be assessed physically and monetarily. It supports the assessment of the prevention policies against impacts, against environmental impacts. And in this case, we use the ecosystem accounts that provide an overview on the uh, land conversion and the loss of habitat systems using the ecosystem accounts and the exploration of the natural resources. And this is, these are done by the ecosystem service accounts and also supporting um, if it is able to comply with the SDGs. Climate change, we have the ecosystem condition and extension accounts that can support in assessing the performance of the many approaches that are based on ecosystems in the context of mitigation and adaptation to the climate change. The theme account of a carbon inventory that is within the ecosystem account analyzing the uh, carbon inventory in the land, in the economy, and throughout the accounting period, this can provide a wide range of indicators to support the audits. The uh, air emission account, that is the central framework, analyzing the generation of greenhouse gases by different economic units. And it re this really provides important information to assess the performance of the measures that will uh, mitigate the uh, greenhouse gases emissions. And there was a task force that was created by the UN Commission for Europe identifying 39 indicators related to climate change, and they could be calculated on the environmental account system. The Agenda 23rd, the environmental uh, accounts can support uh, the uh, generation of uh, several indicators. They can be related to water, climate, 14 and 15 are related to land life. The environmental accounts can also uh, support a, a holistic and integrated approach to audit the SDGs themselves and the Agenda 2030. The environmental accounts can support supply data and metrics to inform, guide, and assess the progress of the government towards a more integrated planning, towards the sustainable development. This can be done by the flow accounts that is part of the central framework that review the intensity of the use of the natural resources by the many sectors of the economy, or by means of the emission accounts that are part of the central framework that analyze the intensity of the emissions associated to the increased activity in many sectors of the economy. Other examples that we have in other areas, we have the waste management, 
uh, for example, the subsystem of the environmental accounts for energy that provides a physical table of the solid waste that is produced by origin and type, energy efficiency, renewable energy, bringing in this case indicators to support the calculation of the indicators associated to SDG 7.2.1 in this case, the use of land and practices of land management under the environmental perspective. This can be analyzed by the ecosystem accounts and this enables us to relate the change of use and the impact on the extension and condition of the ecosystems and also the impact on the whole set of services provided by the ecosystem, among other examples. For example, the reduction of risk of disasters by means of the ecosystem service accounts. There's a whole framework to integrate the regulation services that may contribute for reducing the disaster risks. For example, controlling floods uh, and the extension and uh, condition of ecosystem accounts that can help us to track the trends of ecological integrity, providing a perspective on the risks to surpass the inflection points in the environment. The implementation of the multilateral agreements, addressing biological diversity, the Agenda 2030, fighting against climate change, and also the uh, Climate Change Convention. We also take into account the uh, residual waters with the uh, possibility of uh, contributing for monitoring SDG number six in this case. And I would like to close uh, speaking on how the uh, SAIs can be a lever to develop the environmental economic accounts in the many countries. So there is a strong cooperation potential, saying again cooperation, so there is this strong potential to cooperate. It's fertile ground for the SAIs to cooperate with the uh, account producing institutions. Uh, in this case, they are the national statistical institutes or perhaps the central banks in some other countries or the sectoral banks. There is vast technical experience uh, uh, that the SAIs uh, hold in many areas of the environmental auditing. So they may influence and support the development of the indicators for the accounts. And there is this whole potential with the recent adoption of the ecosystem accounts as a, a milestone in the national programs. And there is a whole field of opportunities for the SAIs to support the national implementation of the ecosystem accounts and to track the progress towards the sustainable development and green growth. With that, I would like to end and thank you. And I apologize for exceeding a little bit my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. It is really a topic that requires time to be explained, right? So I would like to say to you that we are grateful uh, to you for presenting the report. We are recording the presentation. The presentation will be available in the future through the uh, UNAP YouTube channel, as well as Olasafi's and GIZ YouTube channels. So I would like to invite you all. Well, we have been interacting through the Q&A icon that you can see on your screen. So we have been answering some of the questions. Uh, in the Q&A session, we are going to select some of the questions to discuss some of the items here. Unfortunately, it's not going to be able to answer all of the questions, uh, but we are sorting through and answering some of them in written form. I would like to thank Marshu and Adriano. They have answered some of them. Very well, continuing now, I would like to invite Professor Brolio Diaz. He is a PhD in zoology at the Edinburgh University. 
He's an associate professor of the ecology department at the University of Brasilia. He oversees uh, postgraduate students and he does research on biogeography, ecology of fire, ecology of insects and policies for the conservation of biodiversity, the conservation of the uh, Cerrado and the interface science politics. He has had many positions within the Brazilian administration government, director of the IBAMA Research Center from 1991 to 1993, director of the biodiversity conservation up until 2010, and the national secretary of biodiversity and forest between 2010 and 2012. Both were under the Ministry of the Environment. He was the executive secretary of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity from 2012 to 2017, and he played a fundamental role in promoting the implementation of the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011-2020. In 2018, he was awarded with the prize of biodiversity from the Ministry of the Environment. Brolio, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. You have the floor. Mr. Diaz, on to you. You have from 20 to 25 minutes and thank you so much. Thank you, Mateus. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to participate in this event, to take part in this event. And I'm going to be discussing here the relevance of the environmental accounts and the work of the auditing institutions. So let me see if I can upload my presentation now. Very well then. So I'll begin by quickly showing to you the history of three major countries, China, the US and Brazil, which have a history of dilapidation of the natural capital over time. So on my left, on the left, you see the uh, eastern of China that was covered with uh, forests and the central western part was covered with meadows. And then on the right, we see the evolution of the uh, conversion uh, from forests into agricultural areas. And China, a thousand years ago, had depleted most of its native forests. They were exploring forests uh, on the hills of the Himalayan area in the year 1200, 1300 after Christ. So that's the recent chart on the reduction of forest areas in China between 1700 and today. So it is a continuous process in spite of the uh, ancient process that took place in China. So that's a map showing the original forest situation in the United States in 1620, when they truly uh, began with the uh, colonization of the country at, at, at a larger scale. And these were primary forests. The eastern part of the United States had this uh, virgin forest, and we had the Rocky Mountains and the mountains of the western coast as well. On the right, in the upper part, you see the forest situation in 1850 and then in the bottom 1920. You can see that the United States had virtually eliminated most of its forests. They had some forests in the southern region and in some uh, Rocky Mountain regions in the western side. Well, Brazil shows the same pattern. And here on the right, you see on the map, the uh, situation of the uh, Atlantic forest. We lost most of this Atlantic brave forest that uh, most of it is eliminated and what you have left is fragmented. And here to the south, the famous Araucaria forests that uh, conifer forests that have originally 180,000 square kilometers and now we have less than 7% and most of we have what we have left is secondary forest. This is the most recent situation for the Amazon. You know the chart to the left with annual deforestation rates. Unfortunately, Brazil is the world champion in deforestation responding for 
one third of the world deforestation and the map to the right shows the situation of the deforestation in the whole amazonian region not only brazil but the other amazonian countries showing that most of the deforestation in the amazon is unfortunately in the brazilian territory but this is not only loss in forests but in natural assets also show a major loss in fishery stocks one of the the stocks most uh, evident stocks in brazil was the uh, the true sardine and the chart to the right shows that the current uh, catchment of sardine in brazil is less than one fourth to the catches of the 70s this due to the overfishing the excess of fishing that does not allow uh, time for the renewal of the fish stocks recognizing this phenomenon we have uh, a growth of extinctions in the world especially in ocean islands so far and here to the right we have a chart showing the the rate in red a red list in um ocean islands and some groups as psychics uh, uh, cicads are in a major threat threat and in recent years associated to the global warmth a huge number of corals are also under a threat of extinction are threatened species the consequence in this loss of biodiversity i would like to give another example uh, about the uh, the ecosystem services related to pollination some years ago brazil published uh, leaded by the Brazilian platform of biodiversity and ecosystem services and the network of studies about plant pollinator interaction uh, a national report about pollination in Brazilian agriculture and here we see the different groups of organisms that promote pollination in Brazilian agriculture uh, showing that bees respond to the vast majority of the pollination in brazilian agriculture almost 80 percent but we also have bats uh, colibris or hummingbirds uh, flies um, beetles butterflies other groups that are also relevant in pollination this chart to the left shows that one third of the brazilian crops depend fully on animal pollination if there's no animal pollination there's no fruit production one fourth of brazilian uh, crops have high are highly dependent so if there is no pollination they have less fruits small fruits and so sometimes deformed fruits this proves the level of uh, dependence and here the major contribution of bees this is the map showing Brazilian locations with studies about pollination. Fortunately, we have a lot of studies on pollination being conducted in Brazil. And thanks to these studies that have been increasing in the last, in the last few years, you can see in this uh, a bar chart to the left, the number of uh, studies about pollination in Brazil. And the chart to the right shows that this evaluation calculates that animal pollination contributes to 43 billion rios per year of benefits to Brazilian agricultures. So highly significant, the contribution of uh, these services of zoophily. But when there is a, an excess of uh, pesticides 
and implements, we lose pollinators, agricultural production decreases, and this is a threat to the to the food safety for our population. This trend to uh, destruction of nature and natural assets is being very well documented in recent years. Here we have two classic uh, books by Jared Diamond. Uh, first, Guns, Germs and Steel, and the subtitle The Fate of human societies and the other collapse and how societies human societies choose to fail or survive so showing that the collapse of many of the human society societies in the past was due to their bad choices in the management of their natural assets this is a chart i like charge i like a lot uh, showing the problem that we have. We have a, a youth that is concerned with environmental problems illustrated by this lady to the left here calling the attention to the major environmental problems. But a lot of people denying science or saying that God will save us all or other uh, that, well, we are well, all going to die anyway. So why bother? And also, I'd like to call the attention that these problems were well studied and the origin of the, the run out of natural resources uh, is called as a tragedy of the commons. In a classical article by uh, Garrett Harding, an, uh, an, an article, a paper published in 1968 in Science Magazine. And in the year 2009, Eleanor Ostrom uh, was awarded as a no with a Nobel Pri uh, Prize of Economy, talking about how to avoid the tragedy of commons. And the solution is relatively simple. The hard part is executing it. Solution is a good governance. We need to promote and help the implementation of good governance in every country, in every region about the natural resources, the natural assets in uh, on behalf of the collective interest. And I also like very much the Steve Pinker uh, book published in 18, 2018, I'm sorry, translated in the same year to Portuguese, the new uh, illustration, and I call the uh, in the defense of reason, science, and humanism. Unfortunately, this is not what we see in the management of pandemics currently in Brazil. What Steve Pinker draws our attention to is that thanks to the improvement of population education, advancements in science and technology, advancements in the governance systems with more uh, democracy and better communication with a free uh, press. But what we have is that, well, we have important improvements in different uh, aspects, including in the environmental, but this is not uniform in all the countries in the world but these improvements are possible but he draws our attention that this uh, improvements can, can doesn't don't come out of nothing they happen because there's a good governments good use of science and better education of the population advancements in science and etc the book in english is enlightenment now we have many recent reports published about environmental situation in 2019. May 2019, uh, we had the first uh, global evaluation about biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, produced by the Intergovernmental uh, Platform on Biodiversity uh, for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And the conclusion of the report is, unfortunately, generally speaking, on, on the global level, we are losing most of our natural assets. 75% of land surfaces were significantly altered. 66% of oceans have major uh, impacts. 85% of wetlands in the world were lost. 
the uh, uh, deforestation rates are still strong and we lost half of all forests in the world and we see more recently a major decline in coral reefs and a decline in uh, vertebrates under monitoring this well, I won't try to, to reproduce these schematics, but they summarize very well this challenging situation that we are living currently. And I would like to draw your attention to this chart, a study about the planetary limits of sustainability, showing that humankind, due to their over exploitation of natural resources on Earth and access, uh, pollution of waters and air and soil, we are already surpassing the limits to go back in environmental sustainability. In some parts of the world, we already surpassed. And this study called the attention for the excess of pollution due to nitrogen, especially due to agriculture, climate changes, and the loss in biodiversity. The three major environmental problems in the world where there is already evidence that in some geographic scales are surpassed the safe limits for sustainability with no way back. I call the attention to this important uh, report by FAO about the state of biodiversity for food and agriculture in the world, where agricultural sector, which is the sector that mo the destroys biodiversity the most, which shows that agriculture is totally uh, dependent on biodiversity. Nothing can be done without genetic resources, uh, fertility of the soil, pollination, biological control of pests, and so on and so forth. And annually, we have the reports uh, uh, published by the World Economic Forum and recently these are the evaluation of perceived risks with a, a growing perception that the biggest risks in the last few years are the environmental risks so to face the agenda we have in the uh, cop convention on biological diversity or biodiversity we developed in the last decade uh, a set of 20 targets called the Aichi targets here the first four related to the last causes of uh, biodiversity loss the second are targets to face uh, direct causes of biodiversity uh, or consequences like deforestation, loss of uh, fishing. The third, the conservation targets. The fourth, the targets to increase the benefits generated by biodiversity to human well being. And last, targets on the means for implementation. And they have a good correlation, the Aichi targets with the SDGs, in particular SDGs for uh, 14th and 15th about oceans and land ecosystems, uh, G, uh, SD, uh, SDG 6 about water, 2 about food safety and uh, sustainable agriculture, and SDG 11 about uh, sustainable cities, and 12 production and uh, uh, responsible production and consumption systems. And a good correlation that I won't explain now uh, about SDGs listed here with the Aichi biodiversity targets. And I conclude by summarizing an evaluation of on the implementation of, of the 20 IG targets in the last decade. Remembering that now we, we are negotiating the new strategy for biodiversity with uh, updated targets that will start to be implemented as of next year after the approval in COP15. These are the reports of the, the Global Biodiversity Outlook uh, 5. Uh, GBO5 using 
huge amount of sources of information and this is a summary each line is one of the eight it targets and the color coding is in blue and green targets or how much we achieved or surpassed in case of targets in blue is when you we surpass the target in some, some countries in yellow which is the most of uh, most of the countries we have some important advancements but it one was not enough to achieve the target in red targets that didn't present significant advancements and in purple fortunately they are not that much targets where the conditions worsened in the last decade and now i will show you briefly in some selected slides uh, success stories here we have advancements on the on target two aichi target two the increase of countries that incorporated biodiversity values in their national accounting systems exactly according to the methodology that raquel just presented so significant increase which is um, which was very good and here the situation of deforestation in the whole world showing that this is still a problem to be solved a general ten trend for decrease in deforestation in the last two decades unfortunately brazil in the last few years is not in this trend and here on the top reforestation so forest planting in some regions in the world especially asia this is increasing this uh, is very interesting data the potential of major uh, uh, marine fisheries where the establishment of good governance and rules of fishing exploration the fish stocks are recovering and here we have the number of ocean islands where the invasive uh, alien species that lead to the extinction of endemic or uh, uh, species were eradicated almost 70 islands in the last few years which is also very encouraging this is the increase on number of protected areas in brazil the most vigorous uh, growth was marine protected areas here in blue with an expressive growth in the last two decades and i finish by call your calling your attention to success in many projects of conservation in the world that were able to avoid the extinction of uh, species that were in the verge to extinction three to four times more species of birds and mammals have their extinction avoided than species that were extinct in the last two decades this for birds and mammals and i finish with this slide calling the attention to the uh, role of controlling bodies so all of that works this is a cycle first we need governments companies and society to define commitments this must be formalized as objectives and targets measurable objectives and targets that are negotiated and formally approved by governments then we need to promote the uh, means to implement financial resources capacity building training uh, uh, technology transfer and then we need public policies to facilitate them enabling public policies and then we need to define baselines and indicators to monitor the implementation of each of these uh, goals and targets that were agreed upon and then we need the implement the monitoring of this process with the collection gathering and an, uh, analysis of this information and here environmental accounts are one of the best tools and finally uh, we have the role of organizations as the uh, auditing um, institutions that have to evaluate the compliance of policies uh, international policies and com uh, commitments and identify and propose corrections when necessary this is basically what i had to say and i thank the opportunity 
Thank you, Professor Braulio, for your presentation. Quite enlightening. Addressing the current status of biodiversity in the many countries, and especially the importance of measuring that for decision making. Continuing with the event, we are going to have a Q&A session now. We selected here some questions for Brolio, Raquel, and the panel to discuss and answer. The first question is, how can biodiversity be contemplated and how can it supplement the audits in protected areas? So Brolio, Raquel, any of you? I may begin answering this one. First, I would like to congratulate the Court of Audits and the auditing institutions in Latin America, in the Caribbean region, in Portugal and in Spain for analyzing the audit of the effectiveness of the protected areas, because there is no use creating protected areas if there is no budget available, if no technicians are hired, if no management plans are devised, if no inspection mechanisms are established, if there is, for example, no expropriation of the land, if the land's private, for example. Sometimes we have the reserve areas, but uh, uh, nothing is implemented and that doesn't help. So this kind of audit that was done, that was highly coordinated with uh, several countries using standardized methodologies, that's excellent. It's truly an excellent opportunity for us to check our progress in the implementation of one of the key instruments for the conservation of biodiversity, which is the preserved areas, the conserved areas. There is this working group on environmental audit under INTOSAI, that is the international organization bringing together all of the SAIs. And if you go to their portal, um, you may see that there was many other audits on environmental topics in uh, several other continents. But we have to prioritize topics like biodiversity. We have to draw the attention of the audit institutions to that and encourage uh, the uh, completion of more coordinated audits. Working with other areas of biodiversity uh, apart from protected areas. Raquel, so the environmental accounts, that was the question. How can the environmental accounts supplement biodiversity? That was the question, Raquel. Okay. So I gave you some examples and the environmental economic accounts, they give us many opportunities for the environmental audits be them on biodiversity or on other sustainability topics, because they harmonize data, first off, data from many sources, environmental and economic sources as well. So we follow national standards, standards that are acknowledged by the UN. So the environmental accounts, they bring consistent indicators and they are comparable. So it's important in the sphere of the coordinated audits. These are audits that engage many countries and therefore they can be comparable and they should be comparable. The environmental accounts and the recommendations, uh, they do provide standards. So the environmental accounts system provides a typology of ecosystems it's a common ecosystem that is addressed by the countries. It also provides a typology of condition indicators. It provides reference lists for ecosystem services as well. So we have this standardized methodological approach that is very much important in the context of the environmental economic accounts to subsidize the environmental biodiversity audits and also the coordinated audits. As I gave the example before, on Guatemala, I think it's interesting to address this example because it focuses on the environmental accounts and they can be applied in different areas of the accounting of the ecosystems. They can be used in the national territory, but 
they can also be used for the protected areas. Well, the condition of the ecosystem shows the forest loss within the production area. So that's a key indicator. And that's just an example of the type of information on biodiversity that can really subsidize the uh, audits on biodiversity. So Raquel, if you allow me, the, the question was more about audits. So I was not mentioning the environmental accounts, but I would like to add to what uh, Raquel said. It's important because the environmental accounts, they provide official data of the countries. That's very much important. Sometimes we have uh, discussions on environmental topics, discussing uh, data from several institutions, from several researchers, and sometimes the data does not match. So it's important to have official data. Well, and this data is valid for all sectors, for the government itself. The issues that we have with the implementation of the uh, Biodiversity Conver Convention goals, so the greatest difficulty is changing the sectoral policies. I mean, the sectors they use biodiversity. It's not enough to have the environmental sector engaged in each country, because if we are not able to convince the, the use, the sectors that use biodiversity so that they reduce their consumption and increase their yield to be able to reduce the consumption of biodiversity and reduce their impact on the natural capital and the ecosystem services, we are not going to change the situation. So thank you, Braulio. I really apologize for asking the question wrongly. I had to correct it. And now I will connect two questions that I have here. We have a question about the scale of the environmental accounts. So the ecosystems, they do not follow borders, right? They have no borders. So is it possible to have environmental accounts that extrapolate national borders? Second question, the accounts, can they be used in a subnational scale or in reserves of the biosphere, for example, and linked to that, and related to what Brolio just said now, the private sector, you know, because the private sector has a coverage that is borderless. So a company can purchase products, for example, um, cashew from Brazil, and they are located in Peru or Bolivia. So how can the private sector use the environmental accounts to make good decisions? I may begin answering and let me talk about the spatial approach. So the environmental accounts system provides a structure to help to inform analysis and planning, and it provides data and information at the national scale. So it's prepared for the national territory, but we do have the possibility of scaling it down. So uh, it's possible to bring it to the subnational sphere. There is an exemption of that in Brazil. Brazil produced its first uh, national accounts for the national territory. And then the second exercise of the environmental accounts was done and published last year. And it was done for the national territory, but there was regionalized information for the major regions in Brazil. And we saw the examples for other countries. So the environmental economic accounts can also be produced uh, in the water basin context, in the uh, protected area context, in the ecological area context, in the subnational sphere. We do have this flexibility. Everything depends on the availability of the environmental data and the capacity to integrate information that is available at the economic level with the environmental information. The environmental account system cannot provide details on the benefits of the ecosystems at the local level because this structure was devised to subsidize national planning. And we also have the set of uh, benefits associated to the ecosystems, the social benefits, but not all of them will be uh, retrieved from the environmental accounts. But we can apply this in the subnational scale 
at the level of the geographical details that I mentioned to you. So Brolio, would you like to add anything? And then I can speak about the private sector. So yes, thank you, Rachel. Um, the use of the environmental accounts is actually the possibility of playing an influence on decision-making regarding public policies, mostly. So it's important to have this possibility to work in different scales, in different spheres. In a country like Brazil, that is a federative country, it's very nice to have this information at different subunits in our territory. The states of the Federation, the, the water basins, for example, the biomes in Brazil, as it was done by the Brazilian Institute of Statistics and Geography, because we have the states, the water basins, at these scales, we have public management that is individual. And having access to environmental account data for those specific areas under their management, for example, this can really, you know, increase the chances of using the data in the decision making process. Raquel, about the companies, yes, they may benefit from the environmental economic accounts and there are many opportunities to do so. They can also provide, they can be providers of information as well for the accounts themselves. For example, the companies, they have the capability of reacting to changes at a faster pace than that of the public sector. For example, the capacity of the companies to adapt and to establish more sustainable business. So we have an example of the unsustainability of oil as an energy matrix and the companies were able to adapt and devise new sustainable businesses with new energy alternatives. Therefore, they have this capacity of reacting. Another characteristic are the business opportunities that may be uh, associated to the uh, sustainable exploration of the ecosystems. For example, uh, business opportunities associated to the uh, sustainable exploration of natural forests, of uh, preservation units, the economic exploration of uh, remaining areas of forests. In terms of the company facilities, based on the environmental account data, they can choose their locations for installing their facilities and their production facilities, assessing in that case the risk of availability of natural resources at that location where they aim at installing themselves. So they may do the risk assessment for that specific region assessing the uh, access to environmental resources. And there's also information that can be retrieved from the accounts in regards to the impacts and interdependencies of the natural capital. And with that, they can integrate the natural capital in their decision-making and their investment decision-making as well. Thank you so much. So Braulio, would you like to add anything? about the private sector? Well, it would be nice, you know, to gear some communication efforts so that the private companies can make use, can get to know better and make use of the data from the environmental accounts and also uh, the results of the environmental audits that are carried out. So I believe that the companies are under the pressure of the consumers and pressure of the funding agents uh, to become increasingly sustainable. So the information can be quite useful for companies, just like Raquel explained. So the private companies uh, in terms of biodiversity, they really complain about the difficulty to measure biodiversity in their activities. 
we have to move forward in collecting and organizing information on biodiversity, on the environment, on the ecosystem in a very standardized fashion that will definitely help the companies so that they may better incorporate such information in their actions so that they can really show in their reports that they are truly becoming a more sustainable companies. Very well. Thank you, Raquel and Rolio. Quite enlightening, the presentation as well as the uh, discussion here. Now, continuing, moving towards the uh, conclusion of this webinar. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Secretary Hugo Chutzen for his closing remarks. So there is a question here, Hugo from a representative from FES. Oh, he's asking if the SAIs generate environmental statistical data and baselines. He's talking about the uh, Supreme Audit Institutions. Good afternoon. So Mateo's beginning by the question, no, I don't see the SAIs playing this role. The attribution of the Court of Audits is not this one. In Brazil, we do have the institutions that are capable to do that, and they fulfill this role. The uh, control agents are in charge of checking whether the attributions of the many entities are complied with, as they should act. So I cannot specifically answer about the uh, SAIs, because there are many SAIs, including from other countries, but in the Brazilian reality, no. The Court of Audits is not in charge of providing opinions about environmental licensing, for example. We do have the federal agency that is IBAMA in Brazil, so we can check the licensing process, but we cannot you know, have the specific attribution of that agency in the case of Brazil, IBAMA. So, Mateus, uh, there is a quite interesting uh, question that usually the control agencies do. The main asset of an assessment that is made in a control action, the main asset is information, qualified information. So uh, Brolio was uh, speaking about this and one of the topics that is quite important, and I think it's important to highlight that is improving the governance because all in all, this will enable the agencies to better play their roles, to better fulfill their attributions, which as a last resort will contribute to transparency and accountability. And we in the Brazilian society, we need that as a Lato Centro society, we need that. So the uh, controlling agency cannot meet all of the demands. That's why we have the social control. That's why we have the partnerships and the possibility of inducing transparency and accountability of the several entities. Raquel was speaking about something that is quite important to us. Well, what is not assessed will not receive its due value. So the environmental accounts is highly important as we saw, because it provides the appreciation of the public heritage, the public environmental heritage, heritage, which is an asset for countries. And it's out there and it has to be well managed. A final observation that I would like to make to you is about improving communication. And that's a homework that the control agencies have to do my dear colleagues, that is best to communicate what we do. Because by simply improving communication, and it's not that simple, Mateus, this will result in a higher effectiveness of the assessment process. There is no use assessing a control agency. It should not be limited to the management. It has to be shared with the society. But let me make an assessment about the agencies and entities that do that kind of management. As a control agency, we do not receive, you know, a good communication, a good notification on what the managers do, for example. There's much effort underway, but it's not well communicated. As Brolio said earlier, communication is a key point for the control agencies, for the control entities, but also for those who are in charge of uh, the management because they are in charge of the public policies and this will eventually improve accountability and transparency regarding the uh, topics. So these were my final words.
I deeply thank you. I would like to thank all of those who were engaged in this initiative. It was a successful initiative, in my opinion. It is a partnership that has just been materialized, right? Juan, thank you very much. On behalf of our institution, I would like to thank you as the Secretary of External Control of the Agriculture and of the Environment. These are two areas should be fully aligned in our assessment, but also in our policies. So to some extent, the role of the court is to induce enhancements in public controls. So we should have a better interconnection between such important themes for our society, nationally speaking in Brazil, that is agriculture and the environment. But I also believe this is valid for the international community. At the TCU, at the Court of Audits, well, Brazil is an important player in the environmental scenario. And it's also important for the SAI in Brazil. So we are under the OLSFs, that is a Latin American organization, we are present in the Environmental Committee and we are part of the uh, directing board of the Global Environmental Group, that is the WGEA, that is the representative of the environmental uh, arena under INTOSAI, bringing together all of the supreme auditing institutions. And Brazil will be leading INTOSAI as of next year. WGA is such an important area that, that this is one of the most active in the world. Uh, so much is the relevance and so much the need for support and collaboration with information uh, that as we have today with the, pub, uh, the publishing of this report. So once again, thank you very much for all of those involved. And it is a pleasure to be here on behalf of all my colleagues, uh, auditors that uh, perform their job with the greatest uh, application possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugo, for your words. On behalf of UNEP, we are honored with this cooperation and we hope this uh, is a long-standing cooperation. I also would like to extend our uh, thanks to the auditing team in uh, the, the TCU. It's a very fruitful cooperation. Also extend my, my gratitude to GIZ. This is an initiative in the sphere of the regional project in the environmental area, a partnership on the German Cooperation for Sustainable Development through GIZ. For the participants and for the panelists, once again, thank you very much for your participation. This webinar was uh, recorded, will be available in UNAP, TCU, OLAF, OLASAFs and GIZ websites. And with that, I conclude this webinar. Thank you very much, everyone.